Thank you. The first thing I did was that I didn't actually talk on the topic, um, which I was asked to talk about community health and primary care, a state of play, and I decided I really wanted to expand beyond that. If you're going to talk about integration, you just can't talk about those two elements. And besides that, both of those two elements are really up in the air for reasons um, that I will explain. I'll start off to make an obvious comment about what's integrated care, and here's a good WHO definition, right care, right place. And I would want to add right patient, right provider, right care, and right outcome, and right cost. But I'm probably being a bit too ambitious. I'm probably happy at this stage to say, let's at least get the right care in the right place, and hopefully on the right patient. I will want to make an obvious comment about primary care, and Barbara Starfield is certainly one of the most influential international researchers in the primary care space, and her evidence is very clear. The evidence is in international evidence across developed and, and developing countries is that the stronger your primary care sector, the better the care system, the more affordable it is, and the better the patient experience. And that's something we in Australia have completely lost and we have to get back to. And it was interesting hearing this morning, just now in the introduction, about a recommitment to health and social care integration in Scotland, when we in Australia are doing the absolute opposite. And I will talk about that as, as I'm going. I do want to give you a bit of an overview about integration ingredients. There's basically five. I'm not going to talk about all five. <clears throat> but I do want to make a comment that integration is at the level of the patient, and that's really easy to talk about. How do we get this person navigated around a healthcare system? but it's also about the integration of healthcare systems. So from my point of view, there's sort of five things you can do. One is structural. We've got Commonwealth State, public, private, NGO, hospital community, et cetera, et cetera. We've got some policy integration to do. Health, aged care, disability. Scotland is integrating. We are disintegrating those three. We've got health subsets where people in mental health continually look, talk to me and say, we're not part of the rest of the health system, we're different and subacute and blah, blah, blah. There's all sorts of funding mechanisms we believe we can use, and we go through faddish times where we talk about funding, purchasing, commissioning, paying, subsidising, thinking that we've got funding levers that we can use to drive integration, and the evidence on that is mostly pretty weak. We've also got whether we're paying and prepared to pay for population need, capitation-type models, for service activity, we're paying for activity in Australia at the moment, we're pretty mindless about what it is, and whether we want to pay for outcomes, and the evidence on that isn't very good either, and I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, there's also transactional, and of course there's lots of IT companies in the game at the moment, we can improve integration, that's transactional about sharing information, collecting data, using it once, all that sort of stuff, and cultural. And I don't intend to talk about all those, but I am going to start with structural, because that gives us a structural sort of a reality check for the rest of the day. So here's my reality check on structure, and really for Martin, but also for those in the room who don't know their Australian history, there's a little bit of history, and it's not too long, but it's important to get. New South Wales became a penal colony in 1788, and all of the other states became colonies. New South Australia, of course, objects if you say they were a penal colony, because they weren't. And we didn't become a country until 1901, and from 1788 until 1901, the churches and the charities and the states delivered health care. And in that time, they gathered up and owned all of them. And when we got our, finally got, became a country in 1901, we got the Commonwealth, and the six colonies became the states, and the two territories came in afterwards. And in the Constitution of 1901, which is still in place and requires a referendum of two-thirds of the people, health is the responsibility of the states. So when Kevin Rudd went out and said, if we can't get agreement on this, the Commonwealth's going to take over the hospitals, well, guess what? He couldn't have, because that's against the Constitution. And the Constitution was amended in 1946 to allow the Commonwealth to provide health care for returning soldiers. And it wasn't until Whitlam, with the introduction of Medibank, almost 200 years after the colony of New South Wales was established, that the Commonwealth got a role in health care. They are still the new kids on the block and they've still very much got their L plates on. But I did find it really interesting during the debate about health reform a few years ago how many leading groups, particularly medical groups, came out and said the problem of the healthcare system can be solved, the Commonwealth should take it all over. Well, guess what they're not going to? The states and the territories own all public health facilities and infrastructure. 
So the Commonwealth, with the inception of Medicare, agreed to contribute 50% of public hospital funding to, subsidi to compensate states for the pay money that they would lose from patient co-payments. We had five-year health care agreements until 2013. They have now been formally abolished, and most people working in health haven't worked that out yet. 30 years of health care agreements gone. When the Rudd government came in, the states and territories wanted to return to 50-50 funding. It was 36 per cent at that point because the Commonwealth had not contributed its share. Um, the Rudd government said, no, no, you can't have 50 funding. You're getting health reform instead, which, of course, they wanted like a hole in the head. So the Commonwealth is now contributing its share, not on a capitation basis, which the evidence says if you want integration, it's a good way to do it, but on the basis of funding more and more hospital activity. So we've got public hospital financing in 2014, and you've got two sides. Basically, the Commonwealth subsidises fee-for-service on one side, and that's seemingly uncapped. Nobody believes I can seriously go to my GP and send the bill off to Medicare, and Medicare sends it back and says, sorry, we've run out of money. Or if I turn up in the ED for the same condition, I'm going to a system which is demonstrably capped. So the system is perfectly designed to achieve what it's achieving. We got the National Health Reform Agreement in 2011. We had a whole process which said, what's the biggest problem in the healthcare system? The biggest problem is integration. What's the solution? Let's split the system into five structurally. And that's what our structural reality for today is. We've got hospitals that are now a state responsibility, Commonwealth contributing its share on the basis of activity, private sector primary care, Commonwealth subsidies via the Medicare benefit schedule, aged care, including hack for people over 65, is now a Commonwealth responsibility, except that they've now, within health, the Commonwealth, split health and ageing, and ageing has gone off to a new Department of Social Services, and Victoria and WA didn't agree anyway. Disability was under the agreement, the state responsibility, but the National Disability Insurance Scheme that I'll refer to as NDIS is now largely superseding that. And the Commonwealth made a decision that it would, population health, public health and community health are all a state responsibility with no Commonwealth funding for them. So one of the reasons I didn't talk about the state of play of community health is that I'm not sure that community health can have a future when we've got incentives that look like that. In a parallel universe, we got Medicare Locals. You don't remember to need the, you know, don't worry about the name, it'll change inevitably after, what well, I don't know, it'll also be in the review, but they won't be called MLs after that. And they were given three different roles. One I call a micro set of activities, service delivery type stuff, but pretty micro. The next activities best done at a meso level, networking coordination. And the third was a set of activities that are really best done at a macro level. And from my perspective, it's not surprising that some of them have done brilliantly well, but that others have really, really struggled when those three activities are not necessarily best done by the same organisation. And that's really an issue, I think, for the, for the review, both. And I think we can probably predict a couple of things. One is that they won't be called MLs. One is that any boundaries that are inconsistent with LHDs in New South, LHNs in New South Wales will be brought back into line with them. And the third is that they really need a new funding structure so that they don't become just one more project after project after project, but can actually do something else because they're part of the international terminal disease of projectitis in healthcare, where we think we're going to achieve things through projects. The NDIS is another parallel universe. Long-time care and support for people with lifelong disabilities. People believe it's a health scheme, it's actually not. And in fact, health is a specific exclusion. And people look at me with some horror. It's also, by the way, you have to be under 65 and you can't have had a traumatic injury to get into it. There is a national injury insurance scheme in a parallel universe for people with traumatic injury, but that's separate. The point I want to make about this one is that they're inevitably, when you describe a scheme that's for disability but not for health, you end up having to put a boundary and the boundary in this one is therapy for maintenance purposes is okay and therapy for improvements not. So that'll be a really interesting way of further fragmenting the care for some of the most vulnerable pe people in our system. So the incentive for New South Wales in the short term is to close whatever it can. It can't close hospitals and it can't close pop public health, traditional public health because it's got responsibility on the basis that the Commonwealth can fund or subsidise 
private sector, Medicare, Allied Health, Aged Care and the NDIS. And private health care and consumers can pay the rest. And of course, we, in term, international terms, Australia has one of the highest rates of consumer co-payments in the world now. But that really is the incentive that's built into the system. And an obvious question to people in the room, how, is it, how risky is it for New South Wales to leave hospital demand management to other parties, for particularly those for whom they have no formal relationship at all, it's all care, no responsibility? And if I sit back and think we're not just about hospital demand, what does that mean in terms of other unintended co consequences at the state Le state level, such as children at risk, the overflow into justice and corrections and police when we get it wrong in our mental health and disability sectors, public health issues, education, etc. And a real question is how can we use integration to better manage the risk? So the future of community health, from my point of view, this is a, a way we had proposed New South Wales might structure community health about five years ago, and New South Wales really dropped the, dropped the basket and just didn't do it because it was too hard. But there really is a question in my mind now about which bits are likely to survive, given that the incentive is that each time you increase hospital activity, the Commonwealth will click you up 45% of the costs, and each time you gear up community health activity, the Commonwealth will gear you up none of the costs. So the conclusion I want to make on structure is that we are not going to be structurally integrated in the foreseeable future. The Commonwealth and the state will continue to remain separated and they will either split or share, depending on how much they like each other this week, their responsibilities for health. Health, ageing and disability are continually to be structurally separated and at the Commonwealth level it's actually got worse, with ageing and disability now going to a new Department of Social Services splitting off from health. And the mental health branch in health being abolished completely. Primary care, mental health, acute care, subacute care, blah, 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 will all continue as separate streams. That's OK. We get that. Public, private and NGO provision will continue. Community health, I think, is at the crossroads. Organised primary care of the sort that Lewis spoke about is, is really, I think, also at the crossroads. And the obvious point is there's no point waiting for that stuff. We've got to get on with integration and not worry about the structure. So if I now I've eliminated structure off my slide. We're down to four options, really, um, because I think that we can all waste a lot of time waiting for integration. It's not going to happen. So if I just think really about some laws, and this is really about international laws, about what do we need to learn in the next decade or two and beyond, I do want to start with someone called Walter Lutz. Lutz did some fabulous work compare, looking at integration of social and health care internationally, and he came up with six laws. He, he did two studies, and the first one he did the first five laws, and he came back afterwards and he said, actually, I got it completely wrong. The thing I left out was most important was number six. And just to go through, and I don't intend to talk about all those laws, but I will talk about four of them. The first one of these two, you can integrate some of the services for all the people, all the services for some of the people, but you can't integrate all the services for all the people. And the second is your integration is my fragmentation. And I want to make a point that not all patients need or want their health care to be integrated. I am an articulate health consumer who's got very low health care demand, episodic nature only, and I don't want you out there integrating my care. If I wish to go to a private physio and not have the GP know about it, that's my choice. So I'm a self-navigator. We're largely healthy, we're literate, we have episodic contact with the health system and there's not much point trying to integrate our care and not much benefit in doing so. The second other group that I think need what I call the guided navigators, these are the people who are at risk and I'll put children at risk in that category, people at risk of mental illness in that category and also people with acute conditions needing multimodality care. It's not surprising we've seen so much happening in cancer care around cancer nurses, for example, and I put them in that category, but not the person getting their appendix out. And the third are the people with chronic and complex conditions. And then the third cohort I would talk about are the case management group, people who are unable to make informed choices and need more than guided navigation around the system. And certainly for me, the priority is on those people who have chronic conditions and those who are at risk. The system can look after everybody else. And I do want to make a point in this slide, I've tried to talk about five population groups. This is the health benefits, health resource framework. People who are 
well, people who are at risk, etc., and make a point that different strategies, if I go back to my little cookbook, you use different strategies at different points across the care continuum, one model isn't going to fit all. And here, when I talk about primary healthcare, I'm not talking about GPs. GPs do that stuff, do, do bits at all of those points across the system, as do a lot of other people. It's about the nature of the care delivery at that point. So that takes me to laws five and six. The one who integrates calls the tune, and funders like to think the one who funds it calls the tune. And the last is Walter Lutz's re-examination of the issues when he said all integration is local that implementation is always local and has to fit the context, and that large policies should be there to facilitate rather than dictate the structure and pace of local action. And I would argue that both of those can't be right, given that we've got a lot of people at the Commonwealth who thought they could integrate care from the Commonwealth to the point that they didn't even think we needed state-based organisations, which the rest of us did think we needed, but even at the state level, policies at the state level need to create opportunities for integration locally rather than try and drive them and determine them. Another set of laws that I think are important, again based on a lot of the work of Barbara Starfield, is her observation that primary care providers cannot be successful gatekeepers of systems they're not part of. That around the world, the most successful GP gatekeepers are those who are part of the system remunerated via capitation and, and performance measures rather than click-clack fee-for-service medicine. And I think we've got a lot of GPs in Australia who are now prepared to look at more flexible approaches to funding, not all of them, but we don't need all of them either to do it. Strong gatekeeping is not characteristic of fee-for-service arrangements and WHO and others have looked about that. We really need smart funding and payment models to create the right incentives because people actually need time in their day to coordinate care. And we can't do that well under fee-for-service. So there's no point waiting for structural integration. We need to get onto a policy framework at Commonwealth and state level. We need funding which promotes smarter ways of doing business. We need people on the ground then focusing on transactional and culture change to get people working together. For me, there are four priorities. The first is I think New South Wales needs to maintain and extend its commitment to decentralisation. I think the system, the evidence is the system's been really quiet in the media over the last couple of years since we went back to smaller LHDs. The system is always quieter and happier when the system is decentralised. The more we centralise, the more unhappiness there is and the more the system gets out of control. So I think there is an international evidence that's consistent with LUTs, but beyond primary care, I think more broadly, that we need to maintain and extend our commitment to decentralisation. The second, I think, is that we should be looking at how to favour capitation and needs-based funding over fee-for-service and activity-based funding, both of which are just paying for activity irrespective of the utility of that activity. Um, and I think there's a lot of international evidence about how to develop smarter uh, blended and mixed payment models, and certainly I'm talking to a lot more people now in the private sector who are really over fee-for-service. It's administratively a nightmare and would actually like to have a financial set of options that allows them to deliver better quality care and more integrated care. The third, I think, is that we really do need to look at how to optimise use of IT and promote information sharing, that old sort of adding of collect once, use often. I will point out that we have a series of lessons from the, in the New South Wales uh, coordinated care trials and the national coordinated care trials about what happened when in, in the Illawarra trial 2,500 consumers, old people with complex health needs, were asked to consent to have information sh shared. Um, South Australia in the Health Plus trial had the same thing between us. We had 7,000 people. We had two who did not choose to consent out of 7,000. Issues around information sharing are more issues about pr protecting the privacy of providers than the privacy of patients. And I think the last is that we need to support a very well organised and resourced primary and community care sector. Measures of success. Um, Julian Tudor Hart's another of my very favourite um, authors, and I love the way he talks about let's create peripheries of excellence. The future is not about centres of excellence. Sorry, sandstones. It's about peripheries of excellence, because that's actually where we're going to integrate care. We're going to integrate it where people live, not the place they travel to for healthcare. 
We're going to be starting to be really see some evidence of linked up providers. They don't all need to like each other or even need to be funded by the same organ level of government. But through cultural and transactional integration, we want to see some smooth patient journeys. I'd love to see some decision making, both policy and practice, routinely informed by evidence, but also, I think, a measure of success. And this is really picking up Jerry's issue. If we do not learn to better integrate care and promote a primary care approach, we will have a health system we cannot afford to pay for. So a final sort of measure for me is we have to get this right. If we don't, we'll have a system that's not sustainable into the future. Thank you very much. What we might do is take a couple of questions now for Cathy, and then um, we'll have Cathy Ann Martin on, uh, on a sort of mini panel later. So you, you talked about the fantasy world that everybody lives in, that we want structural change, it's not going to happen. Yep. But really, isn't capitation also a fantasy world? We have ha capitation again occurs at two levels. There's the level of the individual, and there's the level of communities. We've had needs-based funding models which have said, here is, I live in the Illawarra, Illawarra's share of funding based on meeting the needs of my population. That's not a fanciful world, that's a world that we've come in and out of and got very close to many, many times. Um, and then we've got scared and we've walked away from it. NDIS, interesting, is a capitation model as well. Interesting about, the interesting thing about the NDIS is that consumers in the NDIS, it's a voucher scheme, get assessed and get the opportunity to either manage their own care um, or have it managed for them, and only 4% have elected to self-manage in the first six months of the scheme. And again, because it's the group that are the really high-need group. So we can't have, I guess I wouldn't go for straight capitation, but I do think capitation with blended payments around activity and outcomes are quite an achievable. And certainly what I would do with general practice is not actually announce it as a new funding model. I would be saying, any GPs who would like this new funding approach, come and play. And some would. So and some could, would. And that's all you need is some. So you put up your measures there, but are your measures measurable? I'm a researcher, of course they are. <laughs> I, I, look, I think Job they are, but I, but I don't think that they're trivial. I mean, these are really the, the critical issues. We are learning how to measure outcomes. We are learning about integration. We're, we're technically getting there. We're not committed, I think, sufficiently to c routine collection of evidence, but I think we could be. Oh, look, I totally agree. And when I was talking about primary health care, I wasn't just saying primary health care equals GPs, GPs equals primary health care. I was really talking about primary health care as that point of the system. And, and whether that's an endocrinologist doing early work with someone in an early stage of pre-morbid diabetes or whether it's a GP, I mean, this obviously it's more efficient. But you're absolutely right, specialist care in the community was completely ignored through the whole of the health reform. In the, the eyes of the people at the table, we had hospitals, we had GPs, and we had aged care. And then at separate, in a separate room, people were talking about disability, whereas nobody was really talking about the future of specialist care in the community. We have to get that right. We won't solve the hospital problem unless we do. So I've just been in Harvey Bay. So okay, this is a New South Wales thing, but in Harvey Bay, there's five ophthalmologists. Yep. None of them will play in the public sector. That's right. Um, and that goes to a pink part of what Andrew's talking about, is what do you integrate with if they won't play? There's a, there's a set of workforce issues there, but I do want to make it, and I, I skipped over this slide, but I'll come back to it. When you uncap one half of the system and you cap the other half of the system, you make it much more fun to play in the uncapped bit. An ophthalmologist say to me all the time, I'm not going to go to the public, when I go to the private hospital, I want something, I get it. And I go to the public hospital, I ask for basic stuff and I don't get it. And the obvious point to make is, when you go to an uncapped system, that'll happen, and when you go to a capped system, that would happen too. And if I cap the public, or the private, and I uncap the public, the incentives would be reversed. And part of it's around changing the incentives that makes it so much more 
interesting and, and positive work experience to be in the private sector where you're click clacking all day. That's the structural reality and we have to do work arounds. It's not a good solution, but a, we've got to go for the best work arounds we can find. And that is partly around the things when I talk to specialists about what do they like about being in the public si system, they like teamwork, they like opportunities for teaching, they like opportunities for research. That's, they're the sorts of things that people find inherently exciting and yet what we're doing of course is reducing opportunities to do all those things because the system's so stressed. Um, there were three rounds of coordinated care trials which, and, and most people who got to the end were so exhausted that they had so much fatigue they didn't even publish properly about them. So we've got this huge gap. The first general round were I think nine trials. Illawarra was randomised, there were only a few that were. We had two and a half thousand people in an intervention group who got care coordination, referred by GPs, got care coordination, etc. Etc. The other half got routine care. Um, our result after two years was that the best thing that patients liked about being in the trial was that they the providers all talked to each other. Um, our, ran, our people in our intervention group cost more and went to nursing homes at a higher rate than people in our control group because essentially we the team assessed a whole lot of unmet need and met it. We hadn't actually worked out how to deal with the back. The mental health and the Aboriginal trials both worked better. But essentially we didn't address a lot of those structural things. We had GPs click clacking fee for service on the outside trying to be care managers. We also found that a lot of the people who were referred to the coordinated care trials were referred by their GPs and they weren't as high a level of need as the people currently in the specialist system. The community nurses, for example, were seeing patients who were much more frail and disabled than the people who were referred by GPs. It was almost like the second tier were coming through. So it reflected a lot of the structure. It's also 10 years ago, and we didn't, they, most of the trials didn't have the IT for the interoperability that would now be possible. It's a short answer, but I can try, I'm happy to give people more information about the trials. The Aboriginal trials were more successful.